Welcome to the Ripple Effect Martial Arts Podcast. Welcome everybody to the podcast. Today we have Mr. Chris Green. He is the president of Remington Hotels, which is one of the top hotel management firms in the United States. He's a pillar of the industry and a self-described, I think this is right, leadership junkie. Is that? Okay. (laughs) So we're going to be talking about leadership today, leading, creating leaders, and um, family. And of course, we'll talk about some karate and martial arts in there too. But welcome to the podcast, Mr. Green. Thanks, Mark. And please call me Chris. I'm glad to be here. (laughs) Sure. Well, so how did you get into the martial arts? Your your daughter has become a black belt. Is that? That's correct. She just achieved her first dan this past uh, two weeks. Uh, How did that start for you? What drew drew you to martial arts? You know, frankly, my wife is a fitness instructor. And um, so I had here I have my sweet little six year old baby girl and uh, my wife was taking her and taking her to the child care at the gym she was going to and they 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 were looking for something for her to do and i always imagined just because she loves to sing and dance and she's really good at that that she would be in some form of singing and dancing and little did i know that as she watched from the kids area in the gym that uh, what would now become ripple effect in middleburg florida was having its very first kickoff classes inside the workout room in the gym. And she was watching with just great enthusiasm and excitement. And uh, she asked her mom if she could try it. And here we are, you know, my uh, cute little blonde baby girl is uh, putting putting out work, right? Uh, And just, I saw her go through her black belt test, which was incredibly difficult. I, I know, you know, you know your children and you know the looks they have on their faces. And I remember at one point she looked over at the window. We were behind the window. We could see her. And the look on her face was just of, I'm not going to make it. But she was so determined to push through. And she did. And I, I'm just unbelievably proud of her. The discipline and the um, just the overall sense of self-worth and self-accomplishment has been incredible to watch. That is Wonderful to hear. I heard you say in the interview that one of the things that you look for in leaders, and this is struck me as a little counterintuitive, but you said not total self confidence or something. It, it, like a overabundance of self confidence is detrimental almost. It is. It's a risk. It's. I really do believe it's a risk, Mark. And I, and the reason I believe it's a risk is the minute. Listen, confidence is important. It's, it's critically important. If you're going to lead others or you're going to take your skills to the next level, you've got to believe in yourself. But there's a teetering point there where overconfidence or in believing, I always say never, ever believe you're on hype, even if you deserve it, right? So um, I, I'm very thankful for my role. And, and it would be very easy to get underneath kind of the feelings of, wow, I'm the president of this large company. And kind of start believing a little bit too much about what Chris Green thinks or says, but that limits what I'm willing to hear from the outside world. So if you're a leader and you, you're you're coming from a place where you only believe in what you think is right, or you're confident in your ego or your belief system, and you're not willing to be open and curious, which is one of my other leadership traits I look for, then you're going to miss out on opportunities to A, engage those around you and get them to enroll in your, what you're trying to get done and B, learn something. I learn something every single day, every single day I learn something. And when we stop, I think that's, that's a, such a risk to our leadership. When you said about your daughter, the look on her face and that you could tell as parents that there, there's, there's something going on there. It's not necessarily self doubt, but it's like, can I do this? And then you overcome it. And that's so interesting to me in Um, the world outside of martial arts. When my older kid was earning a black belt and it was actually just before the black belt test, it was the high brown test. I'll never forget that Mm. going into the school and master me. See, the first thing was standard attention, student creeds, and then 90 pushups. And I was going, whoa, okay. (laughs) It is nine years old. And I saw the same thing, just a, a, a glimmer of 90 okay, you know, let's try to do this. And it took a while, but 
overcoming those kinds of uh, hazards and obstacles. And I'm sure that you've seen a lot of that as a general manager of hotels and resorts and as a leader of a hospitality team. Anything come to mind uh, when you've been in a real clinch, at a big event at a hotel? Sure. Things and how you they're got probably, there. There are probably too many to count, but I, I you know, I think of, the, I mean, for example, there are, you know, I remember back, I was running a resort when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, and I was not in New Orleans. I was in the Gulf Coast of Florida running a large 600 room resort, and it was a Sunday afternoon. And we had, because it was Sunday, you know, that was one of our big checkout days. It was a, a resort where people stayed six or seven nights and they would leave and then we would clean and then they'd check back in. But it was in the fall, I think it was August. And so we had a slow day. Well, we were doing our normal business and noon on Sunday, I'm thinking I'm going to be heading home and go and spend time with the family. Katrina hits um, New Orleans and immediately we went from, because we were about 130 miles from New Orleans. As soon as it hit and it turned towards there, and the question was, how are we going to house not only a normal set of guests with one or two people, but they were coming with pets, their complete family, and we weren't prepared to be sold out that night in hotels, right? We keep food on hand for what we expect based on forecasts. And so I, I remember the look in the eyes of our team standing there having a, a staff meeting at about three o'clock saying, hey, this is what we're going to have to get done. And as a leader, the good news is, is experience and the training, just like all the work that's put in in the, you know, the white belt and then the orange belt and then the green belt, the, all that work is called upon at, when it's needed. And that that is like muscle memory. It's just like those push-ups. You just learn how to do 30, then 40, then 50, then 90. Well, so I had been through a lot, a lot of situations, never one this big, but we we did. We pulled it together. We called in extra staff. We organized the building. We changed the way a lot of the rooms were set up to be able to have multiple people in the rooms. We set up a pet area outside with fencing. All this happened, and we did. We sold every single room, and even some rooms we didn't have. We found some housing for some people. And we made it through. We ended up housing people for, I think it was 60 to 65 days because their houses were destroyed. So it turned from going to an immediate need to a longer need. But the team did admirably. And really for one reason, is they can sense that I wasn't afraid, that I was willing to stand there and fight that battle and charge that hill with them. And that's what people need from leaders is, listen, and I didn't have all the answers, but you have to have a strong enough belief that in effort and the things in your muscle memory will help you persevere. So I think there's a big difference there, Mark, between having this attitude of arrogance where I know I can overcome it to believing everything you've learned and everything you've ever done will help you push through. You may not know what that looks like, but you're going to push through. That's an amazing story. I I think it speaks to the curiosity and flexibility too, because the <clears throat> hospitality industry generally you think of resorts, hotels, people or places you go to get away or a vacation. And historically, they have been a, a center for um, natural disasters or the pandemic or the housing crisis in 27, 28, 29. People needed to find housing, places to live. Yeah. And it was the hospitality industry that really came together to help do that. Yeah, I think people don't realize with the different reasons that we house people. And that's one of the things we go through in training for our front desk and arrival agents is, is you never know what that person coming through the doors experienced, whether they had a house fire and they're they're having a terrible experience and we need to work with them on that, or they're here for a family vacation, or they're here for a funeral, or you just you just never know. So it's not as easy as the one size fits all. So training, the things, for example just like karate, and I, I love bringing it back to this since we're talking about it, but not every form, not number nine hands is not the same as number seven hands for a reason, because not every attack on you is going to be the same, just like in business, not everything coming towards you is going to be the same. You have to have alternative ways to handle it. And I think that's, it's really interesting as I've started to speak about leadership with some of the, uh, the people here, how much all of this lines up 
everything, the training that the, the students go through to, you know, what we go through on a daily basis in business, it's all the same. And I think this is just really preparing them to be already armed for flexibility and curiosity and perseverance and compassion. Those things are they're learning now. Those will benefit them so well in the business world or whatever they choose to do out in the, after they get done. So it's really interesting how that does apply in the way that people look at it. I have a friend who's German born and raised and he's an American citizen now. And he really helped me through the training through black belt and at all the tournaments and all the tests and everything. And uh, our kids went through it together, but he, I remember on the, on the sidelines, in the second black belt test at ripple effect martial arts this is going back some time but he was watching what was happening what the students of all ages and backgrounds and everything were going through and he said can you imagine you have to go through three of these just to earn your black belt and he said you you're you're more prepared than other people for entrance into the military or a firefighting academy um police academy things like that where they're going to be asking you to be really organized, really on top of things, all the while under stress. And I, I went, yeah, you're right. I, this is really impressive. For your daughter, It does she feel, how does she feel about having earned a black belt? Does she reflect on it? It was one of the most, she does. And it was one of the most tense weeks heading into it because it was the culmination of, you know, when your beliefs and your c- confidence conflicts with your fear, right? So when those two run together, you know, am I good enough? Am I strong enough with, well, I'm trained, I've been trained, I can do it. And and there was actually a time during her test, watching through that window, when I saw her switch from timid, not timid, but concerned to overcomer. And that's when I knew, you know, she kind of could get through. For us, board breaking, her board breaking was probably the biggest concern. She's small. She was, she may be 75 pounds right now, 80 maybe. And so she's worked super hard on her breaking and she had to break five boards in the test and all different breaks. And um, the speed break is the one that always concerned her the most. And so she, she got right to it and she just, she broke everything. And then she got to the speed break and she, she hit it the first time and she didn't do it. And I could just see her like buckle down and snap it the second time. It was incredible. So um, she's overjoyed. She she's so proud. Uh, she finally got her her full blown you know embroidered black belt last weekend or two weekends ago, and she, she's just ear to ear. And it's just changed her as a as a young person. She's already a leader. She really does. She teaches. She leads class. She people are drawn to her. She's charismatic. But these things have given her skills to deal with um, adversity and times of strife in a way that my other two kids who are older, I have two older children that we didn't do this with. I didn't do this. We didn't even know about karate at the time. So we uh, didn't have this, but I wish I, if I would have, I would have put them both through it. I'm so glad that you, that you're seeing that those benefits. How about her teachers in the schools as a, a parent watching her get instruction? And what did you, what did you see or admire about, leadership in the schools from the instructors the uh her instructors were incredible so she had uh miss davis and then um master jan lappin of course and then Braden gahan who i believe he's testing for third degree here soon and then uh of course rachel macy master mrs master macy who uh, we call her so they're just incredible super kind but tough and they see potential and they push for that potential. I think that's another uh, aspect of leadership that people don't talk about enough. You know, I'm known as a culture guy, right? And people really mistake culture for weakness. And that's not the same. People mistake kindness for weakness and passion or compassion for weakness. And those are not the same, honestly. If you're very compassionate about someone, you're going to be firmer with them because you're going to help them to see the outcome they need. And um, I actually uh, have a a talk that I give called the riverbanks. And I talk about as a leader, it's a visual that everybody can see. And as a leader, you've got to have firm riverbanks. And as long as everybody that's in either ripple effect martial arts 
or in my hotel business is going down that river and they're all kind of in the river and they're using their skills differently to make our company great or our dojo great, then then that's fine. But I, as the leader, have to have these riverbanks. And if you get up against the riverbanks, my job is to guide you back into the river. My job is not to let you flood because a flood is a wreck. And, and that's what happens to a lot of businesses when there's not firm leadership. Same thing in karate. If there's not firm guidelines of what is and isn't accepted, bowing in, bowing out, you know, appropriate use of terminology, appropriate behavior. When those things fall down, then what do you have? You have a flood and that's just a mess. So I think that it's critical that you are compassionate and fair, but also tough. That's a great metaphor. The idea, I think, is that you're not tough on people. You're helping people realize how tough they can be, kind of. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I so one of the things I've done my whole career is take over broken businesses. So in the management game, what we do is we get a contract to manage a hotel. We go in and we apply a certain set of operating policies and st- procedures to it. And our goal is to you know, create a better outcome for that asset through better leadership, better management, better techniques, whatever. So I've been known my whole career as a turnaround guy, which means it's, it sounds, it sounds great, but it's, it's, uh, means I get broken businesses to work on all the time. And so when I do that, what I normally find is a flood. When I walk in, there's not any strict guidelines about what we're going to look like as a hotel, how we're going to behave, how our service is going to be, how we're going to sell the business, those things, put all those in place. But the team, actually, the same team that people will tell you needs to go away or they're not the right people, all of a sudden starts performing. And the only difference is firmness in leadership, a a clear, specific direction for the business that you're unwilling to bend on. Inside the riverbanks, it's fun. We're all having fun, splashing away, whatever. But don't get outside the riverbanks. You get outside the riverbanks, you're going to have to go work somewhere else. And that's not mean. It's just a fact. The metaphor gets deeper. No pun intended. <laughs> the water gets deeper. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I you, you mentioned in an interview something that was interesting I didn't know about Buffalo when a storm comes. C- can you ex- explain that? What happens with the Buffalo herd a, a storm's coming? That is a little... So, this is... Uh, it's, it's incredible. I did not know this. I learned this from a friend of mine who runs kind of a leadership training thing, but but a buffalo will turn their head and turn their herd into the storm because the fastest it, it's it's you wouldn't think a buffalo would think of that. We think of them just as a big cow kind of right. And to me that's a great way to personify how I want to lead. When you see something coming, you don't want to turn away and reevaluate. You want to lead your head right into it. Lead your team. If you've been trained, which is the job of leaders to train other leaders to lead their people, but turn right into the storm. I think it's such a brilliant metaphor for what leading really looks like. There are uh, two kind of famous quotes, I think. One's from Winston Churchill, and he says, if you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah. And the other one's from Robert Frost, I think, and it's the only way out is through. And Yeah. Has there been a time uh, in your in your business that you've seen that at work? You just described one during Hurricane Katrina, but to go, there's no ducking from this. We have to see this through. Do you recall anything? Sure, I do. So my prior firm, I was a partner in a firm called Chesapeake Hospitality. We were in business since 1957. We were the 25th largest management company, uh, and we were doing very, very well. We actually uh, became CEO of that company in October of 2018, and things were just really going great. And March of, it's kind of an interesting story, March of 2019, on the 9th of March, which is a Friday, I wrote a letter to our team and I said, congratulations, we just had the best year the company's ever had. I'm, and we used to split bonuses into two payments, March and June, just because it was a big hit on our cash flow. So I said, I'm proud to let you know that we're going to pay your full bonus today. And it's a record bonus for everyone here. I sent this letter out as CEO to all of our people. Monday, March the 13th, 2020 is when the world shut down for COVID. So 
this, I guess that day will live in infamy for me. I'm, I'm really glad we did the right thing because I think that decision would have been a lot harder four days later, but our company was one of integrity and the right thing is always the right thing. So I'm glad that money got paid and we never had to even talk about deferring or holding on to it or whatever. Um, but, but COVID had to be the only thing that I've ever experienced where there was no choice. You, did, you didn't know when the storm was going to end. Our business went from, uh, let's say, 100% to 3% overnight. Businesses can't sustain like that. And it was months before the government got involved to uh, have some sort of subsidies. We were, you know, we had thousands. And at that time, I had about 2,800 associates. So you have all these people live in your hands. that You're trying to figure out how to make it whole for them. There was only one way to go, and that was through. So we had on Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. And for every day for the next six months until we went to every other day, we were wearing people out. We would have a complete company call every morning at 7 a.m. And we couldn't leave, so it was on Zoom. And we would go over what happened the day before. What, are we seeing any signs of life? How do we attack the markets? How do we preserve health insurance for our people? It was just a constant. And every morning I had to wake up and push through. Did I want to every day? No. But, you know, I said at the talk that I gave down here, leadership is not a position. It's a responsibility. So, you know, for all the black belts that are growing their, their leadership roles, they need to realize it comes with a lot of things you have to do that you may not want to do every day. And sometimes it means getting up and looking at a screen of two, 300 people, and they're looking back at you wondering what's going to happen next. And you've got to be positive. You've got to be motivated. You've got to have a plan. And imagine making a plan where there is no plan. <laughs> you know, the last time we went through this was 100 years ago with the Spanish flu. So we had no plan. I, I actually was in the hotel business when 9-11 occurred. I remember at, after 9-11, we said, no, oh, nobody's ever going to fly again. Well, we did. And in 08 and 09, the financial crisis, oh, hotels are not going to be a thing anymore. Well, they are. And so then COVID, so, so the, what I do like about having experience and having a little bit of gray hair is I was informed by those two experiences. I knew our business would be back. I didn't know when or how, but I knew it would. And we only had one choice, to put our heads down, turn into the storm and go through it. You're so involved with making sure that people's livelihoods, their families, themselves, their health uh, is taken care of. Why is that so important when you're also trying to get your numbers right? So here's the thing. I, I'm actually in the middle of writing a book. I actually, I'm pretty close to the end. I actually see that the uh, person that's helping me with the writing is texting me now. And I talk in that book about my leadership journey and what I've learned. And honestly, for the first I tell a story about a housekeeper, and for the first eight, eight or nine years of my career, uh, I'm not sure that my belief of who I was as a leader lined up with how I presented. Uh, because I think if I look back and I'm honest with myself, my goals were really positional. I wanted to make the next job. I wanted to do this, and I wanted to, and and I was raised very compassionate. I I was a service oriented, heart led type person. But sometimes I think those things get misaligned because of prioritization. And I was walking through the lobby of a hotel here in Florida. I was the assistant general manager. and I wanted to be a general manager so bad. So I'm bustling through the lobby, moving 100 miles an hour, knocking things out. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And one of our housekeepers in the lobby said to me, um, good morning, Chris, how are you? And I said, fine, how are you? And kept on walking. Right. Because I was moving. I'm a busy guy. And I wanted everybody to know how busy I was. And this this moment changed my life, really. That just happened next. She said, do you even care? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I stopped and thought, wow, it's like I was hit with a hammer, you know, and and right in that moment, I think I was about 34 years old at the time. And in that moment, I turned back and I said, I'm so sorry. You know, I said, I honestly, I did not pay you the attention that you deserve. I was commoditizing people and, and, and really an, a means to an end. And so what I decided right then, and then it didn't happen overnight, it doesn't, but that I was going to be more engaged with my people and let them be the way that we got our results instead of me making the results happen. And I can tell you that I'm a believer I've never asked for a promotion, not since that time, never. 
And I've never touted any kind of specific mathematical process for making our formulas work. I've always talked about our people and I've gotten them to believe in what I'm trying to get done and that them to understand that I care about them and their outcomes. And guess what? They produce great numbers and it makes my job so much easier. That is an amazing story. And True. I love your, uh, how honest you are about telling it. I, it reminds me, I was about the same age, about 32 years old and I had a job at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. And it was my, I'd had that job for about three years and uh, kind of a career path. And I was proud of it. And this is a couple of years after 9-11 and uh, permanent employees of the Smithsonian had what they called the blue badge. And that blue badge, you, you kind of bypassed everything, security um, lines, things like that. And I was having a little bit of a frustrating day, also bustling around between a few museums and I went into this one museum and there's kind of a long line and I just, I flashed my badge and the security guard said, Hey, just wait a minute. And I thought that was a kind of a front, right? I'm going, well, but I have my badge. I need to get where I'm going. And, and he could see that, that I was a little agitated. And I said something really rude, like, well, what are you trying to do? And he said, I'm trying to control entrance. And that struck me like a hammer. I went, wait a minute, this guy's job is to make sure that not just the artifacts, the grounds, but the people themselves are safe in this museum. And I just wait, take all your the time you need um, because you're right. Your job is super important. And I was super rude. And that was an awakening moment. I, I think you, you find that in the karate schools too, where you see someone with a black belt and you're going, somehow they... I have enough trust in this institution and this leadership to know that they earned that black belt. And so there's some measure of respect and some measure of listening, no matter how old I am versus young and everything. And we're going to listen. Um, have you had any stories that you remember uh, over the years in the karate school? I, I remember, well, I remember when uh, my daughter's name is Presley. I remember when Presley first, I don't know, I guess she would have been blue, right? I guess that's right before black and, uh, she started teaching and leading and ripple effect here in um, Orange Park, Flowing Island has really grown. It's really getting, it's really doing great. And so there's a lot of new students coming in. And I can remember people looking at her and she's very humble. She doesn't even, she probably, she probably could be more form, formal sometimes, but she's 11. So, you know, Um <laughs> So, but just the, the way people would look at her in awe, and that's what I'm trying to say is there's a value to that, but, but it's how it's used. If you think about the impact you can make, if you've done all that work and now that she's a black belt, I mean, the little ones, the tiny tigers, and then the other white belts that come in, they're just like looking at her like she hung the moon and she's just, I mean, she's as kind and gentle and helpful with them. The value, it's the same thing in business, right? I, it's its so hard for me. Sometimes I wish I didn't have my job title because I'm really just Chris. I do have the benefit of seeing across the whole organization. I get to see, and and it's another one of the themes of my book. It's actually a story about rafting, that the raft guide sits up high on the back of the raft, the whitewater raft. Well, why? So you can see down river. And that's as leaders, that's the benefit of having this experience and understanding you can see down river and you can watch out for treacherous rocks and rapids for your team. At the same time, you can be present in the raft with them and be friends and be close. So there's this, this use of leadership that I think is critical to understand. Leadership's not a hammer. It, it's, it's not, it's a hug. And it's just the way it has to be. If you really want to get I would tell you that if you talk to my people, I believe that you could talk to all of them and they would run through a wall for me. And it's not because I'm special. It's because they know I got their backs too. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. That's really interesting too about being up high because there's some risk there. You you have a better viewpoint, but you have probably less control than if you're holding an oar. And yeah, so you're, you're putting all your trust in the team. Yeah. So fascinating yeah. i think it's i think leadership's fascinating but the, the thing is marcus when i meet people who are willing to step back and go like you just did with that interaction at the smithsonian that affected you because you remember it 
But but some people would just say, oh my gosh, that guy was a pain in my, you know what, move on with life. You took time to reflect on that. And I think that's the characteristic of real leaders is how do I make myself better for that environment? How do I not make this mistake again? Um, people who can be rude and then just move on with life, I think they've got some work to do because we should not be rude and move on with life. We should be like, why did I react that way? That's not a way to treat somebody else. I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I heard you say in an interview that your grandfather was a railroad worker. Is that right? Yeah, he was a, a brake man on the caboose. I mean, talk about an important job. And then your your father, was this his father? Your father was in the military? They were both. My dad was in the military. Both of my grandfathers were brakemen on the railroad, both of them. Um, my dad was in the military. My brother was in the military. You know, it's just, I come from a lot of, uh, you know, my dad was my hero, but, you know, he, he was a great leader, but he never had a position of leadership. He was somebody that people would be drawn to and he could get he could rally a team but he was never really in a role where he led as a corporate leader but he was a leader among people because of the way he treated people and i learned a lot of what i i know and believe from him and my mom was a hospitality pro i mean she just you know when when somebody said they were coming there was a certain set of things that had to happen at our house to get ready for guests and it just it just kind of formed who i was and then You've got to take that and then use it because I, that's the that's the thing about tapping your leadership. I talk about um, if you're not being who you were made to be, you will always be in conflict. And living in conflict is no fun, not for you or those around you. So figuring out, and that takes some work. That takes talking to others about what they see in your leadership. And that's one of the things that they, you learn in karate. Your leaders will tell you, I see your strengths here. I see your strengths here. I think you need to work on your public speaking. I think you need to work on this project and do some community service. Uh, and I think that that's why that, that's such a valuable a valuable regimen that they go through. Because once you discover who you are, as long as you're willing to be that person, then you can present fully to your teammates, your work, your family, whoever it is. And that's where the value comes from. You're Parents, your grandparents, they must be so proud of you, just like you're proud of Presley. And it, it was so great to talk to you. I want to let everybody know that Chris Green is going to be at the YMCA of the Rockies, right, uh, on November 11th and at 6 p.m. This is an open event. Everybody's welcome. He's going to be talking about leadership. And if you were inspired by what you heard today, well, you really hope that we can see you there. And thank you so much, Chris, for talking. Thank you. It was my honor to be here. I really appreciate it. Mars, good to meet you. Thank you for listening to the Ripple Effect Martial Arts Podcast. Find episodes and more at rippleeffectmartialarts.com.